In this tutorial, we will be discussing the law of constant composition and how to, de and how to depict chemical compounds. Some of the substances we encounter in everyday life are elements. However, most are not elements, they are compounds. Free atoms are rare in nature. A compound is a different form of mixtures of elements. In a compound, the elements combine in fixed, definite proportions. In a mixture, they have any proportions whatsoever. So for instance, mixtures, this balloon here is filled with hydrogen and oxygen. The amount of hydrogen and amount of oxygen gases independently do not matter. They can have as many as, much, as, many as they want. It's not going to interfere with one another. On the right hand side, we have a water balloon. Water has a very distinct chemical formula. There has to be an exact two to one ratio of every hydrogen to each oxygen that are bonded together. Joseph Prowse formally stated that the idea that elements combine in fixed proportions to form compounds. He called this the law of constant composition. And it states that all samples of a given compound have the same proportions of their constituent elements. For example, if we de decompose 18 grams of water, we will get 16 grams of oxygen and 2 grams of hydrogen. To give us an oxygen to hydrogen ratio, 16 over 2 of 8 to 1. This is true of any sample of pure water, no matter the origin of the water, no matter how the water came about. It's going to be the water. If we decompose 17 grams of ammonia, which is NH3, a compound composed of nitrogen and hydrogen, we would get 14 grams of nitrogen and 3 grams of hydrogen. For a nitrogen to hydrogen ratio of 4.7 to 1, even though the atoms are whole number ratios, their masses are not necessarily whole numbers like it was with water. Keep that in mind. You're not necessarily going to get a whole number for the masses. So let's do a practice problem with this. The mass ratio of lead to sulfur and lead to sulfide is 270 grams of lead. to 41.8 grams of sulfur. How much lead is required to completely react 85.6 grams of sulfur? I'm going to put that one on the bottom and I'm going to do this as if it was a ratio. We're going to cross multiply and then divide. Looking at significant figures, this one has four, this one has three, so we're going to have three sig figs in the Final answer, we get 553 grams of lead. That's how much lead we would need to react with 85.6 grams of sulfur. Compounds have a constant composition with respect to mass because they are composed of atoms in fixed ratios. The chemical formula indicates the elements present in present in the compound and the relative number of atoms of each. For example, H2O is the chemical formula for water. It indicates that we have hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And it also states that we have a 2 to 1 ratio. The formula contains the symbol for each element accompanied by a subscript indicating the number of atoms of that element. By convention, the subscript of the 1 for oxygen is omitted. Let's look at a few more. The common chemical formulas include sodium chloride, table salt. We have 1 Na and 1 Cl. Na is sodium, Cl is chlorine. It's a 1 to 1 ratio. Carbon dioxide, C for carbon. There's no 1 there, but it's assumed to be 1. Oxygen is O and 2, so it's a 1 to 2 ratio. And then table sugar, which is sucrose, C12H22O11. There's 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, and 11 oxygens. Notice that they're always whole number ratios. There's never any fractions here. There are never any decimal points here. 
even though the masses might indicate that there would be. You would have to make sure that it's a whole number ratio for the atoms themselves. The masses cannot, can potentially not be whole numbers, whereas the atoms have to be whole numbers. The subscripts of the chemical formulas represent the relative numbers of each type of atom in a chemical compound. They never change for a given compound. So sucrose will always be C12H22O11 no matter what. The subscripts of a chemical formula are part of the compound's definition. If they change, the formula no longer specifies the same compound. For instance, carbon monoxide, CO, is a air pollutant with adverse health effects on humans. When inhaled, carbon monoxide interferes with the blood's ability to carry oxygen, which then can be fatal. Carbon monoxide is the primary substance responsible for deaths of people who inhale, inhale too much automobile exhaust. If you change the subscript of the oxygen from a 1 to a 2, you have a totally different compound. Now it's carbon dioxide, CO2, which is a relatively harmless product of combustion and human respiration. We breathe small amounts of this all the time with no harmful effects. Chemical formulas with the list the most metallic element first. So the formula for table salt is NaCl, not ClNa. In compounds that do not contain a metal, the more metallic-like element is listed first. All right, so metals are found on the left side of the periodic table, and nonmetals are found on the upper right. Among nonmetals, who those are the left on the periodic table are more metal-like than those that are on the right. So as you get closer to the metals, so you go left and down, it becomes more metal-like. So therefore, if you look at nitrogen and oxygen, NO2 and NO are written this way, not the other way around, because NO, nitrogen, is closer to the left. Within a single column in the periodic table, elements on the bottom are more metal-like than the elements towards the top. So if we look at oxygen and sulfur, sulfur is further down, therefore it's written first in SO2 and not O2S. The specific order for listing nonmetal elements in a chemical formula is shown right here. Here, once again, here's sulfur and oxygen. Sulfur was written first. Nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen was written first. So the ones on the left are written before the ones on the right. There are a few historical exceptions in which the most metallic element is named first, such as hydroxide, which is written OH and not the other way around, even though H is written first on the list. Some chemical formulas contain a group of atoms that act as a unit. When several groups of the same kind, of kind are present, their formula is set off in parentheses with a subscript to indicate the number of that group. Many of these groups of atoms have a charge associated with them and are called polyatomic ions. Poly, meaning many, Atomic, so many atoms, ions. Ions have a charge, so many atoms share a charge. To determine the total number of each type of atom in a compound containing a group of these parentheses, multiply the subscript on the outside of the parentheses by the subscript for each atom inside the parentheses. For instance, magnesium nitrate. Magnesium is outside of the parentheses, so it's all by itself, an invisible number one, meaning that there's only one magnesium here. We have two of the NO3 groups within the parentheses. So the subscript for nitrogen is one. One times two, we have two nitrogens here. We do the same thing over here with the oxygen. Three times two to give us six oxygens. So how many hydrogen atoms are there in this formula of ammonium phosphate? The hydrogen is right here. So we're going to take 4 times 3 is equal to 12 hydrogens. Which formula represents the greatest number of atoms? 
So we go through these individually. We have one for the aluminum, two times three is six, three times three is nine, two times three is six. So nine plus six is 15, plus another six is 21, plus a one is 22. For the next one, we have two, two times three is six, seven times three is 14. This also has 22. Part C, one for lead, one times four for hydrogen, one times four for sulfur, four times four for oxygen, making 16. This one has 25. So far, C is the most atoms. Lead is three, one times four is four, four times four is 16. This gives us 23. And finally, one times three is three, four times three is 12, one and four. That gives us 20. So that means C, lead hydrogen sulfate, is the final answer. An empirical formula gives the relative number of atoms in each element in a compound, while the molecular formula gives the actual number of atoms in each element of the molecule. The difference here is the empirical form is the most reduced form, while the molecular formula is what's actually there. For example, the molecular formula of hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. The most reduced form would be the empirical formula being HO. The molecular formula is always the whole number n multiple of the empirical formula. So in other words, if we take HO and multiply it by 2, that whole number gives us H2O2. Many compounds, such as H2O, the molecular formula is the same as the empirical formula. The structural formula uses lines to represent chemical bonds to show how the atoms in a molecule connect to each other. And at the end of this tutorial, we will show a picture of each of them so you can compare them side by side. And finally, we have molecular models. These are three-dimensional representations of molecules and are used to represent compounds. We use two types of molecular models, the ball and stick model and the space filling model. In ball and stick models, we represent atoms as balls and chemical bonds as sticks. The balls and sticks are connected to represent the molecular molecule shape. The balls are color coded and each element is assigned a color as shown in the margin, which I took that picture up, but I'm sure you can look it up in a book. Also keep in mind that different models use different colors. That's why I took that picture out. In space filling models, atoms fill the space between each, or each other to more closely represent our best idea of how, mo how a molecule might look if we could scale it to the visible size. So here's a visualization of all of them. A molecular formula is right here. It has, it shows the number of elements and how many of each atom. So it gives you the, chem, the, the elemental symbol and the number of each. The structural formula, which is here, shows you the lines in which the atoms are connected to one another. The ball and stick and space filling models here illustrate the geometry of the molecule and how the atoms are arranged in three dimensions. Notice the difference between these two. The space filling fills in the gaps where the sticks make. And those are your chemical formulas.